Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the guys here at Flying Miata. And today on our Facebook Live, we are going to talk about uh, some high horsepower basics and things of that nature. So we've got a lot to talk about today, so let's get started. Um, over the course of time, we have sold and had a lot of experience with all kinds of different high horsepower things for Miatas. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are actually on this specific 1995 M edition back here that we're gonna show you. And then there's some other things we can talk about as well. And I've got a great list of customer questions so that we can get to. Um, <clears throat> full disclosure, a lot of the things on this 95 car that we have sold over the years, we no longer actually sell for various legal reasons as we're kind of re-sculpting our, our brand and our footprint to be more 50 state legal and compliant. However, we still have a lot of experience with all these things because we did this for a very long time and uh, you know had a lot of success with it. So let's just get started with the stuff that's on this car and then we can go into some other things. So once again, this is a 95. We bought this car new and it's been a development car since then. And you know, we've, we've put it through a lot. It's made a lot of horsepower over the years. It's been turbocharged, supercharged in various iterations, lots and lots of different things. At the moment, and this is how this car has been probably since about 2010 or so, we have a two liter stroker in here where we take the BP engine and we had a stroker kit, um, <clears throat> rods, pistons, and crank that turned it into a 1995 CC engine. And uh, that was very successful for a long time. This particular one, it's a VVT engine out of uh, an NB2 with that intake manifold. And we have our, once again, now discontinued FM2R turbo system. And this was where we used an external wastegate 3071 turbo. And uh, we, we could support turbo setups up into the low 400s. At one point, this thing made about 425 at the wheels on E85. And I believe we actually have a dyno run of this car from 10 years or so ago doing that on a YouTube video that we can probably link for you if you're curious to see what 400 plus on E85 on the dyno looks and sounds like. And the car has been running fantastic this whole time. Uh, over 400 horse, well, really over about 350, we would munch transmissions. So in normal street trim, you know, we drive this car at about 325 horse and it's been totally reliable for a very long time that way. Uh, we had a product here called a big spark kit. You might know that the NAs and NBs have a batch ignition system with the standalone ECUs that we used to sell, specifically the Hydro Nemesis ECU, we could do a full sequential system. And I know some of the other ECUs on the market, such as the Mega Squirt, et cetera, uh, 221, can also do that, where we convert it from a batch system to a full sequential system using LS3 coils, which are very, very strong. There's other coils on the market that are good for high RPM, but they're not necessarily any stronger. Um, you know, the Toyota coils, for example, got, guys have success with them, but they're nowhere near as powerful as these LS coils. And then, you know, we would have our ATI damper down here, if you can get some light on that. I would do an ATI damper on any engine. If I had a bone stock NA or NB and I wasn't doing anything to it horsepower wise, I would still do an ATI damper. It smooths it out. On the standalone cars, you can get more ignition timing in it. It's a really awesome thing to do, even if you're not looking for horsepower, just because of how well it smooths out the engine. Um, also on this, we had a big flex fuel system. We had systems where we could run either gas or E85 in full flex fuel fashion with the Hydra ECU and some of the other ECUs on the market can do that as well. And so there is a complimentary fuel system that replaced everything from the pump all the way up through the rail and injectors. It replaced it all with dash 6AN fuel line, um, you know, high, high volume pump, high volume fuel pressure regulator, all the things. Uh, so, and this also has one of our level two clutches and lightweight flywheels in it. We have a level one clutch that's appropriate for most people that can handle anything a stock engine internally can do, you know, up to 300 horse or so, give or take. And then we have a level two clutch, which does have a little bit more pedal effort. It's not crazy. Uh, I think it's about 24 pounds of pedal effort, uh, whereas stock is maybe eight or nine pounds and our level one is like 11 or 12 pounds. So it's about double the pedal effort of our level one clutch. However, it can handle power, uh, you know, with this car, with other 400 plus wheel cars that we've done, we've had our level two clutch in there and it's been fine. Um, so we also have, and this is a really old version, but our aluminum radiator and our spall fan kit. Uh, once again, this car has been around for a long time and so it's got some vintage stuff in it. Uh, however, just to point out that, you know, we've had these solutions 
most of which we still offer, some of which are vintage, but that cover all the needs and all the experience for the high horsepower stuff. Years and years ago, this car had a, a Quaif, not sequential, but a, a Quaif semi dog cut gearbox in it. Um, you know, we stopped selling those. And since we've blown up five speeds in these high horsepower cars, we've just been using six speeds. Uh, we do a cocktail blend of Redline MTL one quart and then another quart of Redline um, lightweight shockproof. And the shockproof is really like honey. It's really sticky on the gears. And in the high horsepower cars with the six speeds, we really haven't had much trouble. It's a good idea still to keep a spare transmission around if you're running high horsepower. But with that combination, we've had pretty good luck overall. And of course, the stock 1.8 differentials, um, you know, we've had uh, OS Geiken in the, this in the past, but I don't think it's in there right now. But anyway, it just really hasn't been an issue because the differentials in these really aren't horsepower limited. They're more traction wheel hop limited, you're going to break these differentials if you've got bad wheel hop, not if you have a lot of horsepower. Whereas the transmissions on a street car, the five speeds will start breaking around 300 horse and the six speeds will start breaking around 350 horse. On a track car, you can bring that number down, you know, 25 or 50 horse, just depending on, you know, how aggressive you are um, with your driving versus if you have a little more mechanical empathy. So uh, we're not going to talk about suspension or brakes or anything today. Let's just talk about the drive line and the horsepower. So, you know, we've had similar things over the years for the NC and the ND. We had a supercharger kit for the NC for a number of years. Unfortunately, that's discontinued. And we currently have turbo kits for the ND, which I can give you a quick peek over here on this car, that are really awesome. They fill out the power band in these cars amazing. You know, it's not a high horsepower setup like we have the potential to do on NAs and NVs. So if you want a high horsepower setup and you don't want to do a V8 conversion, you know, with a turbo, you're still better off going with an NA or NB. But to have a setup on an ND that's really awesome in terms of drivability, it takes it from about 150 wheel up to about 200 wheel, give or take. It really fills in the power band. Um, the, the turbo is definitely the way to go. And we've tried superchargers on these. They were not successful for us for a number of reasons. So we went back to the turbo. And to hit on that a little bit, for NAs, NBs, and NDs, we've tried many superchargers over the years. And in the long run, they've just not panned out to be successful for a variety of reasons. We've gone with turbos. We have 50 state legal turbos for NAs, NBs, and NDs. They're solid. They check all the boxes. We're super happy with them. That's what we've been successful with, and that's what we still sell and recommend. So that's kind of a basic overview. Um, let's, let's just go ahead and dive into some questions. Oh, real quick, I have here on the table some of the things you can't see on the outside with our built engines. We have Wysco make special custom pistons for us, and these are made to our specifications. Uh, you know, very, we spent a lot of years really dialing in the design of this piston, everything from the taper to the coatings to the rings that we use uh, to, you know, try to get it so that it's not only strong and effective, but also reasonably quiet for a forged piston, because a lot of forged pistons can be fairly noisy. And these, you know, if your machinist does the correct job on setting up the block to fit these, I mean, they're a little noisier than stock, but, you know, not like some that you would expect. Also, we have uh, uprated valves. Um, here's, an, here's an example of an old unsuccessful version where we used to use the stainless valves. Now we only use ink and L valves on the intake and the exhaust. And that's just from experiences like this, where, you know, you have a lot of high horsepower applications that'll, uh, you know, hammer out the valve face and close up the lash, even on the stainless stuff. A lot of that having to do with high EGTs and, you know, things of that nature from running pump gas on high horsepower turbos, et cetera. So, I mean, and now on the guts, you know, we're only using the ink and L exhaust. So, you know, we have a long history of testing stuff, racing stuff, having lots of our customers use our thing, getting feedback and being able to really fine tune in what works for the high horsepower setups and, you know, what's going to be successful. What are the things we're going to stay away from? So, okay, let's get into some questions. And also uh, we do have Kyle, our awesome person back here looking at questions that are coming through. So if we get through some of these and any ancillary things come up, we can try to take care of those as well. So thank you guys. This is a very diverse group of questions. Okay, uh, first one, and I'm just gonna do this stuff off the top of my head. So can you lay out a good sequence of power upgrades after a basic turbo setup, like an FM stage one, such as aftermarket ECU, bigger exhaust, fuel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you're thinking of your power goals, I always ask this question when somebody shoots me an email. Um, and it's, first of all, do you have power, do you have goals for the power? What's the goal for the car? Because a lot of guys will say, I want 300 horsepower. Okay, well, where did 300 come from? Um, you know, is it just because that sounds like a good number? 
or you know, is there something more behind it? Because there's a lot of variables in there in terms of how far you can get before you hit breakpoints where all of a sudden things are going to get a lot more expensive compared to your return on that. You know, how fast is the car? What are you looking to try to achieve? Um, and then also, what's your budget? You know, our, our stage one turbo systems, our basic stuff where you do a turbo kit, a fan, a clutch, uh, you know, a cooling system, exhaust, you know, those are things that we like to, th you know, we hope that, you know, most guys that, you know, have a job and you've got, you know, some willpower, you can handle these things, no problem. But then there's places where you draw a line and you get over that line where things are going to start to get a lot more expensive. Um, so, for example, our stage one setup, you know, that's good to, depending on the year of the car, 170 to 200 wheel horse, which is a solid bump and it's 50 state legal. We used to sell the FM2 system with the standalone ECU, which we no longer sell standalones for legal reasons, but that would, with the same hardware, get you up to, uh, you know, 225 to 250 horse at the wheel and still be safe. And that was about as far as we would recommend you would go on a stock internal engine. Guys can still do that. We still sell DIY turbo kits, you know, kind of build your own. If you want to get some stuff from us and some stuff from other people, totally fine. We support that. It's just, you know, there are things that we've opted not to do for legal reasons. Um, so if you're looking at good return for the investment, it's getting up to that, what we used to have as an FM2 level. And that's gonna be basically with one of our turbo systems. And then, you know, you're gonna to wanna to add, we also have bigger fuel injectors and you're from another firm, you need to add a standalone ECU. Level one clutch would be fine. Um, with a stage one turbo system, we like to keep the exhaust on the small side, either stock or two and a quarter inch. Two and a half inch can be a little iffy because when you reduce your exhaust back pressure, you increase your mechanical base boost and the stage one turbo systems are fuel limited. So if you go too big of an exhaust, you're gonna run too much boost and run out of fuel and you're gonna be in trouble. Whereas when you get to that standalone level, definitely if you can go to a three inch, go there. Because with a turbo system, you're better off with no back pressure. So the least amount of back pressure you can have, you're going to be better off. But pragmatically, in order to be able to sustain that, you need to get into a standalone system. Um, so, you know, there's a line in the sand there. And then once you get past that, okay, I've done all these things and I want to take it even further up to 300 plus horse, that's when you're getting into a built engine. Uh, you know, your stock trans is going to start to get a little iffy. More importantly, when you start to get up over 12 PSI with a standalone, even with good tuning, in the long run, you're going to start to wear out your rings. You might break a rod, you know, some of these other things. So that's, you know, between that 250 to 300 range is kind of the gray area where you got to start to th think about a built engine. And then over 300 for sure, um, you got to start to think about a built engine. And, you know, you get a built engine, those are starting at, you know, six grand up to 10 or 12 grand, depending on how crazy you want to get with it. Um, and then you're talking about heavier duty clutches and all the other things that are going to go along with it. Um, you know, if you're going to be tracking the car, you're going to have extreme demands on the cooling system. So, you know, even if you're doing some of these other things, we have a lot of experience and, you know, myself or the other techs are happy to help you try to construct it, what your specific scenario should look like. So, you know, in, in terms of this question, that's kind of a general overview. If you have specific things, you know, you can shoot us an email at support at flyingmeata.com. Um, you know, our guys are fortunate. Things are really good and we're super busy right now, but we will get back to you and we apologize if it takes a little bit of time. So, let's see. California legal power upgrades. That's an interesting thing to think about. Everybody thinks about it as California legal as far as power upgrades, but one thing to remember is that California legal is really 50 state legal in terms of a lot of things. Most states just don't care, but the EPA cares and California cares. So what, where we're going with a lot of our products is by getting a California CARB approval, we're putting ourselves in a position where the feds say, if you have a CARB approval, we accept your product for 50 state legality. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that are like, you know, in an intake or a set of headers, that's probably not that big of a deal. But when you get into emissions defeat stuff like an ECU or, you know, anything that's, you know, changing the emissions footprint of the car uh, significantly, you know, that, that does become a bigger deal. And one of the reasons why we're going down the path that we are. So it's a good thing to, you know, to try to change your construct from thinking about California legal to thinking about 50 state legal, because that's really where that's where the market and the trends and the policies and the laws are going is 50 state legal. So, you know, California always leads the pack with these things, love it or hate it. It is, it is what it is. And so that's kind of where the trend is, is going. That being said, once again, we have 50 state legal turbo kits or NAs, NBs, and NDs. We would love to have one for an NC one day. It's something we're looking into, um, but it's something that's still on the drawing board. So 
for the NC guys. There are some other things, like for example, our, our Randall intake for the early cars, which is just a little bolt-on fresh air thing. You know, we, we have paperwork for that, but it didn't actually have to go through testing. All right. Thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> There's other things that we're thinking about for California and for the rest of the country, but it's you kind of have to weigh out you know the cost benefit and so you know we're a business and you know we want to support all you guys and do the best we can and we have to do things that make good business sense so uh, at the moment the big deal really is the 50 state legal turbo kits because that's something that is you know clearly in the crosshairs of the emissions people and all those other things so things like exhaust you have to remember post cat it doesn't matter there, there's noise ordinances post cat but once you get past that last cat you know, there's no legal requirement as far as that. So it's just everything, you know, from the air filter all the way through that last cat is what they're going to be concerned with. Okay, best engine management options for high horsepower. Well, when we used to sell the Hydro Nemesis ECU, which we no longer do, obviously we felt that was the best one, and it was certainly the most well-developed and most maturated of anything. Uh, you know, the vast majority of our customers could just drop in the base map and drive the car, and most guys never even went to the dyno because the base maps were pretty dialed in. Um, most of the other solutions on the market, you are going to have to go to the dyno and pay somebody to set it up for you. Really, with engine management, there's, there's a number of players in the market. Most of them are solid, mostly. The question is, really, who do you have local to you that is good, and what systems do they support? That's really the big deal. If you live somewhere where your local tuner, who everybody knows and trusts to do a good job, says, hey, I'm super good with Megasquirt. Well, guess what you should get? If you live somewhere where the guy says, hey, I'm super good with 221s, or I'm super good with Haltex, or whatever, guess what you should get? Because they're all capable systems, and the really important part is finding one that can be well supported in your area so you can get it set up, and if you have issues, you have somebody that can help you address it. That's really, really, really important. Um, you know, they, they've pretty much all got the capability, because the high horsepower part is easy. Um, you know, it's really the hard part is the drivability. It's the idle control, the start quality. You know, the, the daily drivability stuff is way, way harder than the high horsepower stuff. So even for guys who know what they're doing. Okay, uh, let's see. For This guy says he's got an NA8, same as an NA6, in terms of this question, with our FM turbo kit, and I assume that means our current 50 state legal stage one kit. If I want to get more power other than the ECU swap, what do I need to swap? Injectors or what else? Well, it's very important to remember that our stage one kit is specifically designed for the stock injectors. It's emissions compliant with the stock injectors. It provides the correct amount of fuel for the stock injectors. If you go putting in bigger injectors, yes, on one hand, your closed loop system does have the resolution to handle a slightly larger injector, but it's not gonna be good for your idle fueling. Um, I, we've, this is, people have been doing this for 20, 25, as long as there's been turbo Miatas, people have been doing this. I'm very familiar with it. And if you go too big on your injector, then it, the closed loop can't even handle it. And in either case, you're going to have richer situations where if you have emissions, you're not going to pass. Even if you don't have emissions, you can have situations where you're just running excessively rich, potentially washing your cylinder walls, which is going to take out your cross hatching, cause your rings to wear prematurely. So it's important to remember that with the stage one systems, use the stock injectors. That's what it's designed for. If you want more horsepower and you want to get away from that 50 state legality, you know, as the owner of the car, that's your call. Um, and then you would look to a standalone ECU and a larger set of injectors and then bring in your boost up to suit, you know, bit mirroring what we used to do in the old FM2 setups. In terms of within a stage one system, because it's injector limited and fuel limited, you know, you you can get all the power you can even with a stock exhaust. Going with a bigger exhaust is going to allow your boost rise to happen a little bit faster, so you're gonna get a little bit more bottom end torque, but you have to balance that with being careful not to go too big on the exhaust where you're running too much mechanical base boost and you run out of fuel. So there is a balance there, um, and that balance, you know, somewhere between two and a quarter and two and a half inch is where you're probably gonna hit the wall depending on where you live and how much octane you have available. You know, out west with 91 octane, you wanna be a little more conservative than guys out east with 93 octane. It just is what it is. You know, we have to deal with that out here. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's really not a lot extra because you're fuel limited is I guess where I'm going with that. And if you, if you wanna take it past that, then don't nickel and dime it, just do it the right way. Um, you know, trying to, 
people have done this before and you know the, the results are pretty well documented. Let's see, how do you prep the drive train to handle the power? Well, being aware of what the limiting factors are is important. For example, we don't like to run a stock BP engine long term about, you know, past around, well, for an, for an NA about 12 PSI on a standard size turbo, which is, you know, 220, 250 wheel for an NB about 10 PSI, which is gonna be about the same. So that's kind of our limiting factor for long-term reliability. For the transmissions, we talked about you know, what the horsepower reliability was on those. For the differential, we talked about that. So really, it, it's just about prepping it to doing your maintenance. You know, is it time to change your fluids? Is it time to put in better fluids? Is it time to do your belts and hoses? Is it time to do your spark plugs and wires? A lot of guys, you know, we ship a lot of turbo kits where guys didn't buy spark plugs and wires. And you know, if you're gonna run your stock heat range five plugs and skinny little blue wires, um, well, you should at least get colder plugs. So, you know, you gotta think about the big picture. Also, the turbo is gonna put more torque on the engine. So in the case, well, I don't know what this one has on it, but do you need to do your engine mounts? I can pretty much guarantee you that on an, a, an NA or NB at this point, if you have stock engine mounts, especially on an NA, I can pretty much guarantee you that they're torn in half at this point. And when you lift up that engine, they're gonna come out in two pieces. Um, so we sell Mazda Comp engine mounts that are 40% stiffer rubber or poly engine mounts, which I would do on a track car. Um, they're a little noisy on a street car. But, you know, the Mazda Comp stuff is going to help to tighten that up. So, you know, if you can come over here, and I don't know how hot this is right now, a little bit. So I'm putting, ah, hot. Um, so I'm shaking that pretty hard and the engine's not moving. If you can grab your oil cap and give it a good shake and see your engine rock, guess what? Okay, new mounts. So the prep is thinking about the peripheral things, belts and hoses, timing belt, water pump. If you really wanna do all that stuff well, uh, you know, go ahead and do your clutch in advance. And while I'm in there, hey, should I do my rear main seal? Should I do my clutch um, slave cylinder? Should I do a steel bearded clutch hose? What are all these things you can do to, because the fundamentals of these cars are so solid. And that's, you know, we've been doing this a long time and it's one of the reasons is Mazda did an awesome job on making these solid cars. And as they age, rubber things wear out, plastic things wear out. The metal stuff is usually pretty solid. So going through and looking at it and saying, okay, you know, what can I do to kind of bring this back to new? You know, how can I refresh this stuff? And in some cases, you know, how can I make it a little bit better? So for example, with the turbo doing the Mazda comp engine mounts instead of stock engine mounts, because you're gonna be adding that extra torque. And by keeping the engine more solid, you're gonna be less likely to, you know, miss a shift because everything's rocking and rolling so much in there. So, you know, think about that as far as how can I make the big picture a super solid thing so that when I add this horsepower, it's gonna be stable. Um, you know, if you've ever driven a car where somebody slapped a turbo on there and then left the stock suspension and brakes on the car, it can be kind of terrifying because you just doubled your power and you didn't do anything about your handling and your stopping. So it's a package deal. We're not gonna talk about suspension and brakes today, but think about it as a package. Think about the big picture and how you can organically make all these things be harmonious with each other so that as a driver, you can have the best possible experience because that's what it's all about. It's about you know, how do you feel when you're behind the wheel and putting these things together and thinking about that big picture really allows you to get the best possible experience as a driver when you're behind the wheel, really. And that, that's what it's about. So, and maybe scaring your passenger. So secondary. Uh, best gearing transmission options for a high horsepower Miata, kind of covered that. Like I said, um, we just run for, for the 300 plus horsepower cars. We run a six speed with the cocktail um, and it's been fine. Uh, like I said, we don't run this car over 400 horse much, especially now that we've actually lost E85 where we live. It, you can buy it in 55 gallon drums, but it's kind of a pain in the butt because so, we don't have the pump anymore. So this car spends most of its time just about 325 and it, it's been fine. Um, is E85 worth running on a naturally aspirated engine? Yes, if you're racing for money. I've dyno tuned a number of our customers who were competitive racers and on a naturally aspirated engine that was all set up for you know, competitive racing, um, mostly autocrossers, you know, so they're not doing crazy high compression or anything. But I've seen probably a five horsepower improvement between pump gas and E85, which for those guys, Every horsepower counts. For a street car, you want to spend that much money for five horsepower? Eh, yeah, maybe, maybe you do. That, you know, it's your call. Um, but for a turbo car, E85 is amazing. 
highly recommend it. So it's, I had a lot of fun with that stuff because you're just not knock limited and that gas just doesn't matter anymore, which is crazy for us. Kyle, do you have something? Is the stock intake okay with the turbo? Uh, he notices a lot of people use the skunk. What's our thing? Okay, yeah, let's jump in. So this gentleman, I assume, maybe a lady, asked if the stock intake is okay with the turbo or if people, you know, because a lot of people use the skunk intake. Absolutely. So we've dyno tuned all the intakes. We, we used to have a test rig where we could just do ceteris paribus testing on things to really get down to, you know, what the differences were. Um, and specifically on NBs because there's a couple different options. There's the 99-2000 intake manifold with the V... ICS butterflies, which absolutely work. There's the 01 to 05 intake manifold with the VTCS butterflies, which are just for cold start and they're really kind of a restriction. And then there's the skunk intake manifold, um, which is very similar power wise to one of the flat top intake manifolds available in the Japanese and European market, which guys used to pay a bunch of money for before the skunks came on the scene. So <clears throat> in a nutshell, the, the flat tops in the skunk intake manifolds do absolutely give you more top end horsepower. No question about it. On a car like this, I think going from this intake manifold to a flat top or a skunk got us about 30 horse on the top end. So it was no joke. And we've got dyno charts up in Miata net forum and I'd have to go back and dig them up to kind of see the specifics of some of these things. But moral of the story is the VICS 99 manifold, as I recall, has the same bottom end as the VTCS, but because of the VICS butterflies, it has more top end so that it's better across the board. It's a bigger power band. It, the VICS absolutely works. The Skunk and the flat top, they have way more top end than all of them, but I, I don't remember if the bottom end on the Skunk was, which one it was more similar to it's kind of splitting hairs. Moral of the story, if you're racing and if your power band includes you you want your power band to keep going past 6,000, yes, do the skunk or the flat top. On a street car, most of your time driving is between three and 5,000, three and 6,000 RPM. You're not redlining a ton in a street car, so your usable power band is down low. Um, I really like the VICS manifold in street cars because with that butterfly, it really maximizes your usable street power band. So you can use any of them. You're gonna make plenty of power with any of them. There's just some nuances that I think are a little aimed at, is this a street car versus this is a track car? So, um, and then with the, the throttle bodies, you know, the, the skunk throttle body is fantastic for a track car. It solves an issue where a lot of guys who are spending lots of time bouncing off the red line on track would have throttle shaft breakages or screws fall out and get sucked into the intake. And you know, the skunk is kind of aimed at that. It's not gonna give you any power difference. There's no difference at all there, but it is gonna have reliability at the expense of idle quality in a street car. So, uh, you know, the idle quality and the idle control on those aftermarket throttle bodies isn't gonna be as good as stock. So once again, street car, track car, as long as you know what to expect, then you can make the decision that's right for you. Yes, Kyle? Uh, on the same topic of intakes, uh, would you recommend switching to a flat top over the VTCS or MB2 manifold on the turbo car? Um, and then... Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's the same answer. Would we recommend switching to a flat top? The flat top and the skunk, they both do the same thing. They both give you a bump on the top end. So, you know, what, what do you, the skunks, we have them in stock available new, whereas the flat tops can be pretty hard to get. And, you know, when those were selling, they were selling for like 500 bucks back in the day um, because they were imported from Japan or European market. So, whereas the skunks are on the shelf, brand new. So, and you don't get some dirty, nasty thing that's, you know, who knows where it's been. So, but the, the net effect is about the same. So, it really kind of depends on, you know, what do you have available. Uh, Follow-up question, mm -hmm. I think specific to the flat top, uh, would you, would the check engine light come on? So I'm assuming a stage one turbo. So would the check engine light come on with a flat top? If you have, well, yeah. the flat top, uh, gosh, to be honest, I don't remember if the flat top has EGR in it because it's foreign market. Um, 
the biggest trigger there is that when you're losing EGR on a stock ECU, yes, you'll absolutely have a check engine light. And it's just not really necessary to lose EGR. On a standalone, it's obviously, it's not gonna matter. Um, you know, the Skunk doesn't have the provision for standalone, so you know what that answer is gonna be. With the flat top, honestly, I just don't remember. Because with the VICS or VTCS, if you have a stock computer, you can just leave the solenoid plugged in and tape it up somewhere if it's a big deal. But the EGR, just being honest, I don't remember if that one has that provision or not since it's a foreign market. And you know, some of the foreign market stuff doesn't have the same emission standards that we do in the States. That being said, EGR is not evil, it has a purpose. Um, and so if your EGR is operational, there's really not a good reason to delete it, honestly. You know, it's, it, d deleting emission stuff that's operational is, we, we don't really recommend it. Um, you know, you think you're gonna get something that you're not really gonna get for a streetcar, so. Okay, so suggestions for cams for a BP4W. We've tested a lot of cams over the years, and we've been successful with basically none of them. Um, as far as a turbo car, in my opinion, and everybody has one of those, the stock cams up to about 15 or 18 PSI, you're fine. Over 18, 20 PSI, yes, up to 30 PSI is you know, about the highest we've seen guys go, 30, 33. Yes, at those higher boost levels, you can definitely get a benefit from a more aggressive cam. Um, the, I just don't think the benefit is, is there so much at the lower boost levels. And naturally aspirated, there's been a lot of cams we've tested here that guys at sea level say they have great results with, and on our dyno, man, we just got nothing. And I don't know if it's because of our elevation or what, but really we just haven't, except for the really high horsepower, high boost cars, we've just had on the dyno, not really great luck with cams. So that's why we never sold cams because we couldn't back it up and we're not gonna sell stuff we can't back up. So let's see, maximum amount and maximum safe horsepower, torque, et cetera, with stock internals on BP and a turbo kit while keeping it reliable. Touched on that a little bit already. Um, you know, around on a 1.8, you know, 240, 250 wheel at 10 or 12 pounds of boost, depending on NA or NB, is what we've been doing for decades, and it's proven to be reliable with a standalone and with solid calibration. You know, that's the key thing, once again, getting back to, do you have somebody who can calibrate this well for you? Because it's a lot easier to make a calibration bad than it is to make it right, let me tell you. So, <clears throat> and what's the recommended fuel pump and injector size for that amount of power? Injector size is easy. We've just always gone with 550s for you know, any standard turbo setup. We've done, we've done everything from 450s to 2000s over the years, but almost everyone can be covered either with 550s or with like uh, our injector dynamics 1050s, depending on your horsepower level and whether you're using pump gas or E85. 99 point something percent of people can be covered with one of those two injectors. So that's what we've stocked for a lot of years because it's just not worth it to get into the weeds. At this point, we're only selling the, the Bosch EV14 injectors from really solid companies that know how to, to set them up. Um, and it's, that's, that's a solved problem. And you know, that, it, that's, that's stable. As far as fuel pumps, <clears throat> we sell the Deutschworks fuel pumps, which we've been very happy with. They're quieter than the old Walbro that was the, the go-to for a long time. Uh, and they're E85, well, the, the 300 series is E85 compliant. The 100 series is not. For most guys, if you need a new fuel pump because yours is, is dead and you're not doing anything crazy, turbo kit, stock in, engine, pump gas, just do the, the, the Deutschworks 100 series pump. That's gonna handle all your business. If you're doing high horsepower with a built engine, you know, 300 plus horse, or if you're doing E85 and you have a standalone, then you're gonna wanna go with the 300 because that one's E85 and obviously it's got the flow. We use that 300 on a number of turbo and V8 cars that are over 400 at the wheel. Um, you know, about 420, 450 at the wheel is the top end of the things we've built here in the shop. Um, we do have customers who have built things up into the five and 600 horsepower range. And so from working with them, we have some knowledge, although we haven't built anything that powerful here at the shop. So things like, you know, your head gasket and, you know, stock head gaskets really don't start to let go until about 500 foot pounds of torque, we've, we've learned. And stock chassis, I think it was somewhere in the 600 horse range where the stock chassis started to do bad things on the dyno. Um, 
So but there's, there's so few guys that are taking it to that level. I mean, there's so few guys going over 400, but in five and 600, I mean, you could, you could count them on your fingers and toes. There's just not that many guys. So we've learned a lot from them. And, you know, a lot of that is kind of dreaming um, because it's a yeah, 400 horse Miata is fast. It's really fast. So, uh, yeah, you've, you've really got to have some serious goals and serious budget to be able to get up into those levels. Um, let's see. This guy wants to know, is it possible to cohabitate a standalone ECU with the stock ECU <laughs> with a switch? No. I think there may be a way to do it and we have absolutely no interest in it. We've thought about it for people in the past and the level of complication involved. Um, thanks for the question. We got nothing for you on that. And it's, we, we've, we've chosen to have nothing for that based on things that we've dealt with in the past. Let's see. Um, mm -hmm. So the Miata head seems to be a limitation and porting seems to yield mixed results all around. Is it worth the time, money, effort to mess with ports, valves, and such? Okay. When building an engine, I always explain it to guys in this fashion. You've got meat and potatoes and you've got icing on the cake. Okay. Your meat and potatoes are gonna be your forged rods. We, we would do the, the, the Carrillo Super A-beams or the Carrillo H-beams. The A-beams we do you know, for builds up to about 400 horse, and the H-beams we do for builds you know, expecting to go over 400 horse. Or if a guy just wants some more reliability. Or, this is just something I've noticed and I have no proof for, all of our H-beam builds continue to make power to really high RPM where the A-beam builds have a tendency for the torque to fall off before you get there. Never been able to figure out why, but that's an observation that we've made over many builds over the years. So, and then we've got the Wysco pistons, you know, meat and potatoes. We have the ARP head and main studs. Um, we have the Supertech valve springs for guys who want to make power, you know, the single springs and the double springs for the guys that want to make a ton of power. So those are important things when you're talking about making power. We've got the ATI damper, which is I think super important and overlooked by a lot of people. So, you know, those are the meat and potato things. And then we have the icing on the cake. Porting and polishing is icing on the cake. What that's gonna do is that's gonna improve your efficiency. So basically, if you have a turbo and you're trying to operate an efficiency window, you know, you've got your compressor chart, you know, you're looking at flow versus power versus heat, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> what the porting does is it, it allows you to say, for example, in a turbo car, I, say with this thing, I can make 300 horse on a stock head at 12 PSI. And then when I build out the head and I port it, I can make the same 300 horse at 10 PSI. So what did I do is I improved my efficiency. You're still gonna get there. You know, you can still turn up the turbo a little bit and get that extra flow. So the porting is, it's, if you have the extra money in the budget, yeah, do your porting, you know, do your other icing on the cake things. But, um, you know, if the budget's tight, stick with the meat and potatoes because, you know, you can still turn the boost up a little bit on a turbo car and get to basically the same place with just a little bit of a hit to the heat and the thermal efficiency. So, um, <laughs> let's see, tips for heat management in hot environments like 100 plus degrees. Well, 100 plus, really, 90, 95 plus degree track sessions with a turbo car there's only so much you can do. You can do, I mean, you have to do all the things. And you can do all the things. Cross flow radiator, fan kit, oil cooler, ducting, vents, you name it. <laughs> if you have air conditioning in your car still and you don't want to take it out, there's only so much you're going to be able to do. It, sorry. You know, there, there's just a limitation to how much heat this can shed when you're doubling your power output on a really hot day. Um, so yes, you should do all those things, especially if you live somewhere in the South where you know, you've got brutal heat, brutal humidity, and you're trying to do track days with the turbo setup. So you know, what are your options? Doing all the cooling things possible, you know, hood louvers, vents, custom ducting in the mouth to force all of your air through the heat exchanger because the, the key thing here is how much air can I move across my heat exchanger? That is a critical aspect of this. How many heat exchangers do I have? Do I have an oil cooler? You know, do I have 
the best like radiator, like our crossflow and the, the fans, especially the brushless fans, which move a tremendous amount of air across the heat exchanger. And if you still want to run in street trim, there's there's only so much you can do. So and you need to do it all if you're going to be, you know, have a modicum of, of success in those situations. If you're willing to turn it into a track car, take out the air conditioning, that's going to help you a lot. There are still some situations where it's not going to make it go away, depending if it's 100 plus degrees. So you just have to be practical about it. You know, you do all the things, and you, you know, the, you do the best you can. You know, you're. That's it's, it's physics, and you know it's without doing all those things you're not going to get a lap around the track so it's you know okay can i go from getting three quarters of a lap before i overheat on a hundred plus degree day to, hey maybe i can get four or five laps and then i got to come do a cool down awesome but you know thinking that on a hundred plus degree day doubling your horsepower you're going to go run 40 minute sessions well some cars can a lot of cars can't you know you're kind of you're on the edge so that's just pragmatic observance um Let's see, the limiting factor for a Miata engine after you build with rods, pistons, studs, valves, et cetera, et cetera. Are the cams not allowing more horsepower or is it the crank? Well, you know, an engine is an air pump and you do all these things to try to optimize the flow of air through the engine and <clears throat> all these things to strengthen it to handle that increase in airflow. And this is still an air pump, guys, designed in the 80s. We love these cars. These cars are fantastic. And they, they're not, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's an old design. They're not gonna flow like a brand new ND head is gonna flow or something that's making, you know, over 100 horsepower per liter naturally aspirated that's got all that engineering in it. It's just not gonna happen. So you can get to those high horsepower levels. Uh, you know, these cranks, the forge cranks don't break how far do you want to go and what's your budget is really where that question comes back to. You know, what is your actual goal? What are you actually trying to accomplish with the car? You know, that's a good time to get into the five whys. You know, if you ask why and you ask why and you ask why, if you do that five times, four or five, you're going to get to the root of what are you really trying to accomplish here? And then be honest with yourself. This is really what I'm trying to accomplish. Okay, let's address that goal. Let's talk with some guys that can help us and let's see how I can act, get to that actual goal instead of beating around the bush. So, um, boring engine, pros and cons. Well, then go buy an exciting engine. <laughs> Back in the day when we were developing the stroker kit, we bisected a couple engines to figure out how much meat was in the cylinder walls so that we knew how far we were comfortable going when building the stroker because we were trying to get the thing to two liter. And, you know, stock on a BP is 83 millimeter. Our standard turbo pistons are 84 millimeter. Our turbo strokers are 84 and a half, and our high compression pistons are all 85 millimeter. We decided that was as far as we were comfortable going based on the average wall thickness, and we've been pretty successful that way. Over the years, I've, I can only think of one, maybe two guys that I know of that have cracked cylinder walls, and one of them was making 600 wheel horsepower with water injection. So was it because his wall got too thin? I Probably not. Um, so yeah, if you know, if you want to put in forged internals, time to bore. So we personally, we would never build an engine without boring it out. You know, we're not going to just take an engine that's, that's just up to our standards and throw in rods and pistons. You know, we, anything that we were to build here is going to be, you know, our best practices. And, you know, that's all we're interested in. <clears throat> uh, mods and high horsepower adders for ND and NC specifically. Yes, let me show you, it's right over here. If you have an NC or an ND and you want high horsepower, you want a V8. So there it is, guys. That's how you get high horsepower out of NCs and NDs and NAs and NBs, but you can get the same horsepower out of NAs and NBs with the turbo. It's just a little different and a little more high strung, but it gets better gas mileage, so hey. And that's not trying to glaze over the question, that's just the answer. Um, okay, what problems can a person have daily driving a high horsepower Miata? That's a great question. This particular car, I've probably spent more time driving this car than anybody else. Um, and I haven't had 
I haven't had any problems. Um, you know, blew up a transmission on track one time, but you know, that's not strange. <clears throat> if you do it well, it's really not like anything else. You know, you, you, the most important things with the forged engine is just keeping your fluids clean. You know, I hate to say it, but I've seen guys that spend 10 grand on a stroker and the engine comes back and it's like, it looks like they haven't changed the oil in a year. It's like, come on, you know, with the forged engine, you've got to put extra effort into keeping your fluids clean. Um, and you know, it's fluids cheaper than steel, I'll tell you that. So if you do it well and you have some mechanical empathy and you aren't freaked out by possibly having a breakage that you gotta fix because it, it's gonna happen eventually, it's just a matter of what and when with high horsepower stuff, it's really not a problem. You know, if, if this is your only car and you have to daily drive it and if your car breaks down, you're gonna get fired from your job, well, maybe you shouldn't be pushing the limit or maybe you should get a second car, really. Push the limit and then just get something that's, you know, go get a Civic. Um, so Kyle, you got some? I've got a few. I don't know how many of these we want to try to get to. Um, want me to just go down the list? Sure. Uh, first question, any experience or opinion on the AEM EMS4? Uh, AEM EMS questions, we have never really utilized one. When the AEM first came out with the EMS, they actually sent a serial number for the Miata. They sent a serial number one, and it might still be in a box around here somewhere. Um, but obviously, that was a long time ago, and they've come a long way since then. You know, we're, we know AEM. We know those guys. You know, they're a really good group of people. Um, don't have any experience with their EMS. And once again, I'm sure it's a very capable system. Do you have someone who you trust who is comfortable with calibrating that system is really the answer to that question. So. This next question is probably a topic on its own, but it's uh, supercharger versus turbocharger, pros and cons. Okay, pros versus turbo and super. We covered that a little while ago, just in high level. Um, that's a total rabbit hole. We can an entire video on that. that can be a whole video. Yeah, it's, it's personal opinion. Our personal opinion for driving and selling these and, and taking care of our customers who have bought these, importantly, for the last 25, I don't know, long time, years. If you look at our catalog, there's a reason we only have turbos. Okay, next question. Um, I think you've already covered this, but what's the approximate max power that the stock block can handle? Approximate max power for a stock block, um, <clears throat> for long-term reliability, covered this, but we'll double check on it, for a, for a for an NA6, about 12 PSI on a standard size, 20, like a 2560 turbo, for you know about 225 wheel. On an NA8, you know about 12 PSI for you know 240, 250 horse. On an NB, about 10 PSI for about 240, 250 horse. And that's been our historical happy place for this is going to live a long time and be happy and healthy. Once you start to get over 250 horse on the BP, you start to wear things out prematurely. Even if you don't have a breakage, which you can, things are just going to wear out prematurely. So. This one could be another for a street car. Its own, um, but also has a question within it. Uh, naturally aspirated versus high power, naturally aspirated hmm. versus forced induction, pros and cons, and can you get up to 9,000 RPM? Okay, um, high horsepower, naturally aspirated. Let me show you this car again. This is high horsepower, naturally aspirated. Okay, joking aside, we've done lots of high compression naturally aspirated uh, 1.8 builds over the years, 11, 11 and a half compression, which is about as far as we want to go. And you're going to spend double the money for a third the power. Yes, you can do it. And we've built a lot of guys that said, you know what, this is what I want. Absolutely. You know, if that's what you want and you, you understand what you're getting into, yeah, absolutely. But you know, a high horsepower naturally aspirated BP is going to be 150 to 180 horse at the wheels. Um, I mean, well, hold on, let me think about that for a second. Have we ever even done one that was that hot? But so I think the, the high compression strokers were usually around 165 wheel. I think we've seen them up to 180, but it was, it was weird and not average. So a high compression 1.8 was usually around 150 at the wheel and a high compression stroker was around 165 at the wheel. 
for an engine that's $12,000 plus a $2,000 standalone plus all the time to install it and set it up versus putting four grand into a stage one turbo kit and a clutch and getting the same power, not a little bit better. And turbo makes off idle turbos make more power. So, you know, that, okay, naturally aspirated are more responsive, but hey, when you overlay the dynos off idle, the turbos are making more power. So, sorry guys. And then last one, um, can you do lower compression pistons without a check engine light? On a stock engine, can you do lower compression pistons without a check engine light? I don't know if the engine management on a, on a on an NA or NB, I don't think the engine management's gonna care if your compression goes down as long as you're not misfiring. Um, you're gonna lose power, and I don't know if the calibration is gonna be good, and if you have emissions testing, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. But if you're not worried about those things and you go down a little bit in compression, but why would you unless it's a VVT? You know, because really the only the VVT stock engines, you gotta be a little careful with the turbo on those. We like to run about six PSI instead of eight on 91 octane, on 93 octane, you can get a little, you can probably still get back up to eight. But that's where you gotta be a little bit conservative is 91 octane turbo on a stock VVT engine uh, with, with a stage one system, with a standalone, doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, probably, I guess I, I would have to understand more about why you would wanna do that, but probably. And there was another question you had in there earlier about getting 9,000 RPM. Um, if you wanna get to 9,000 RPM, I, we don't have any Hondas in the shop, so I can't show you. Um, it's just not practical. Yeah, guys have tried it, and I'm not saying you can't do it, but when you're on the dyno, you've got to look at your power band, and there's gonna, it's gonna get into a serious point of diminishing returns and really, really high strain on the rotating assembly of the drive line, really high. And so for that diminishing returns, I'm not gonna say it's impossible, but I'm gonna have to say, you're gonna have to want it really bad to do all the things to make it so that you're not just creating more problems than you need. So, or get a Honda. Um, couple more on here before we wrap it up today. Uh, <laughs> here's a good one, ideal power for a Miata. Well, this is a very interesting thing. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna speak to my opinion. Everybody has one of those. And I guess someone asks, so you get to hear mine. I have two, well, yeah, in A and B and, and, and all, all the gens. I, in D and in A and B to me are really a lot the same because they're about the same weight. A stock in D was the same weight as my 94R package, you know, that just, and they handle just so much better. But anyway, I digress. I have two places personally that I think are the sweet spots for horsepower. One of them is about 200 wheel, and the other one is about 350 wheel. Um, if I was building something and I had my druthers, I would like to be in one of those two places. So at 200 wheel, in my opinion, the balance of the chassis is on point with the power that's being produced. As you produce more power, Obviously, the hand, you know, do it for a long time. You know, most turbo Miatas out there are making 220 to 250 with a standalone, but you get into a point where the what are the the Japanese terms for it that Mazda likes to use the the, the horse and rider Jinba Atai is that it? Anyway, some of you guys probably know, but the, the the feeling of horse and rider gets a little bit out of sync. Now, more horsepower, more better. So fast forward, and up to where this car is, you know, I usually daily this at about 325 wheel, but let's call it at 325 to 350 wheel. To me, that's the next node of sweetness. It has power. I never ever think, oh, I wish this car had more power. And I've had this thing up over 400 wheel because over 400 wheel, things start to get manic. Um, and I won't talk about V8s because the power band of the V8 is so different, that's an entirely different conversation. So in terms of the four cylinder, over 400 with the turbo, it just gets manic. We've built tons of them, they're awesome, they're fun to drive, but they're also a lot of work. And there's something to be said for your enjoyment can be had at the point where the pedal meets the floor, and so how much time do you get to spend there? And man, when you're up in the 400 horsepower range, you're not spending much time there compared to 
you know, something that's a little more sedate. So I like that happy 200 horse balance point personally. And then I like about that 325, 350 point of that's enough power without it being manic power. So in terms of the connection of the car and the driver, obviously more horsepower, more better. I like horsepower probably more than most people, but I'm specifically talking about that connection between the car and the driver. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Da, 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 da. Does the chassis handy th handle 350 horse well? Yeah, like I said, the chassis doesn't start to get weird till probably 600. Um, so, and later chassis, the better, because the chassis absolutely got stiffer as time went on and Mazda improved the engineering. So the early chassis are way more noodly, and that really stands out, especially in the V8 cars. Uh, when you have that amazing amount of torque as well on the bottom end, it really showcases how the earlier chassis are a lot more noodly. Um, and, you know, there's some other questions on here that I think we're going to skip just in terms of not being out of the scope. So I appreciate all your guys' questions. Kyle, do you have anything else that's come through on the feed? Nope, that's it. So, okay. Anyway, um, you know, back to we have, we've been doing high horsepower for a long time, even though we're not currently selling a lot of the stuff. So we're happy to help you sculpt where you're trying to go with your car if you call in well call if you email support at and talk to our guys and you know see how we still can help you both with the parts that we do sell and take care of and if we can just help you kind of distill some of the plans or the ideas in your head so um yeah if you guys have any specific questions let us know and thank you very much for your business and we'll see you next week all right thanks everyone bye <laughs>